let's start today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which this festival is being presented, the Yuggera people. I also pay respect to Australia's First Nations, who we recognise as the first scientists and custodians of the lands and environments and all animate and inanimate things within it. I acknowledge the importance of their legacy, passed from one generation to the other for over 50,000 years, and on caring for Mother Earth and contemporary scientific conversations. I acknowledge the deep and timeless relationship between country and Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islanders, and also pay respect to the elders of the community, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who are with us today. Now, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Pandemic, the race for a cure. Queensland Museum is proud to host World Science Festival Brisbane, and we thank our partners for their support. Now, I'm going to introduce you to the experts that we're going to hear from today. Our first speaker is Dr. Larissa Labson, who is dedicated to unravelling the mystery of how our immune system detects and responds to acute viral infections, including COVID-19. Welcome, Larissa. Hi. Thanks for having me. And our second speaker is Professor Paul Young. He studies viral diseases and develops new and improved vaccines for virus of both human and animal origin. Good morning, everyone. So let's get straight into it. We all know that we're living through a pandemic at the moment, but Paul, what exactly is a pandemic? So a pan pandemic is, um, is, is when you see a, a disease outbreak, and we often call them epidemics, you may have heard of that word, uh, but on a global scale. So pandemic simply comes from the, the Greek origins, pan meaning all or, or, or beyond, and demos, which is uh, democracy, is, uh, is another word that comes from that. So it, it means uh, population, so the whole population. And so a pandemic is when a, when a pathogen emerges and spreads globally. So it's... We've got a germ. What are some of the, the ingredients of a pandemic? Sort of, it's got to be a disease, and it's got to sort of make us sick. But then there's a third ingredient. No one's ever had it before. Is that, that's what we're seeing now? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, I mean, in some pandemics can spread out where, where we've seen the pathogen before, so we call that a re-emerging outbreak. Uh, but we often see new ones coming along that we've never seen before, like COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. That's, that's a virus that's spilt out from um, an animal population. We're not quite sure exactly the route it got uh, to us, but what you need is that, is that pathogen, that infectious agent, in this case a virus, a host in which it can replicate and, and grow, us. Uh, and normally it, it grows, we think, in, in bats. So here's a virus that's spilled out from that population, possibly via another species, into another susceptible host, humans. And this one just happens to have hit the sweet spot in terms of its transmissibility and also the, um, uh, the disease it causes. So we'll come back to the stuff about animals in a little while, but Larissa, how often do pandemics happen? It's a really good question, Tegan. Um, has anyone heard of the Spanish flu before? Yeah, so that was about 100 years ago, thereabouts. And that was probably the last time there was a really big pandemic that, that affected the whole world. But we've also had Ebola, um, Zika. So actually pandemics are happening all the time and there's a bit of a threat that they could happen even more often with things like climate change because as Paul mentioned a lot of these infectious things like bacteria or viruses they come from different animals and different hosts and as the, the globe warms up and the climate changes where those animals go changes. So mosquitoes are really good at transmitting a lot of viruses. Um, and as the climate warms, those mosquitoes will travel further. Also, as we encroach um, as humans into more wildlife spaces, our interactions with wildlife grows. So probably we're going to see more and more pandemics over the coming years. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> in fact, it's been monitored over the last 30 years. And we've had these outbreaks, um, pandemic or epidemics even, um, uh, continually for recorded history. But uh, certainly in the last 30 years, we've actually been recording an increase. Right, So, but it's not the first time we've had pandemics. They've happened in, in history. And one of the oldest ones that people probably have heard of is the plague. Has anyone heard of the plague before? 
<laughs> that's, that's the way. Um, Paul, what was the plague, or what is the plague? Yeah, the a plague is a, ge a general term um, prior to us even knowing about infectious agents, which is really only a couple of hundred years old. Uh, prior to that, any, any of these disease um, outbreaks were called the plague. They weren't always the same thing. The one we most know about from a historical perspective is the bubonic plague, um, emerged in the Middle Ages around about 1350 or thereabouts and um, swept through Europe. And it caused, it's estimated, it swept through Europe. It was interesting. Um, we know that it probably had a history in, in China, and so there's a, a, a parallel here. China swept through India uh, and also into Africa and, and the, the Middle East. And then um, it, there were 12 ships that left the Black, uh, the Black Sea and, and came into a port in, in Sicily. And it turned out that there were a lot of dead sailors on, on those boats and also those infected. They were immediately sent back out because people knew about disease and quarantine. But unfortunately, it was too late. And that was the introduction of, uh, of the bubonic plague into, uh, into Europe at that time. The subsequent spread, it's thought that um, that killed about 200 million people at the time. And that, if you look up you know, what the Earth's population was in those days, that's about half the world's population. So that's the potential impact that pandemics can have. But we've known about them a lot longer. There's the an an Antonine Plague um, during the time of, uh, of Marcus Aurelius, about 160 AD in Rome. There's the Justinian Plague uh, that started in Constantinople, or what we now know as Istanbul, and then spread through Europe. That, um, that killed about 20% of the world's population. So these have been happening regularly throughout um, human history. So the plague is caused by a bacteria. It's not extinct in the world, but we can treat it. But other pandemics, including the one we're currently living through, is caused by a virus. Um, and one pandemic caused by a virus was the Spanish flu, which we just talked about. So Larissa, what happened 100 years ago to cause that pandemic? Yeah, so it was called by, caused by an influenza virus. So probably you've all had the flu. Um, and this particular strain of flu, it came from an animal. We don't know which one. And basically, uh, because it was a pandemic, um, it hadn't been seen in humans before. So that meant we had no immunity to it and our bodies didn't know how to fight it. And what happened at the time was it was really infectious. So people were already fighting in World War I and then this flu has hit and people didn't know how to fight it. So, you know, lots and lots of people got sick. They're estimating up to 50 million people. And what was unusual about this particular flu was that people in the age range of about 20 to 30, they started getting really sick. So normally with flu, it, it hits really young babies and it hits older people. Um, and so you can see some pictures up there of people in hospital beds, and it's kind of like now, they, they didn't know how to fight it. People were wearing masks. It was highly contagious, and they didn't know how to treat it. So um, it was a pretty devastating pandemic and killed way more people than actually died fighting in World War I. And then another, another scary disease that we've fought in human history is smallpox. Um, what can you tell us about smallpox? Yeah, so smallpox probably none of you have been vaccinated against it, and that's because it was being eradicated. So smallpox was also caused by a virus, and it caused, um, part of its name was it caused all these pustules to arise on the skin. So you'd catch smallpox, it was super contagious. They estimate it killed um, sort of 500 million people in the last 100 years it was around, and it was a really bad disease, you, if you caught smallpox, there was a 30% chance you'd die. Um, and people knew about this for ages, and I think Paul's going to talk about it, but it was the first uh, disease we managed to develop a vaccine for, and it was really how the whole sort of study of vaccines started, and it's been so successful that it was eradicated um, in the, the 1970s, I think it was, and that's why people bef born before 1970, they'll have um, a small scar on their arm, so if you ask your grandparents, you can probably see it, and that's the smallpox vaccine. But after it's been eradicated, we don't get vaccinated against it anymore because it's no longer a threat. So um, that can work, and that's a real success story of vaccines. Yeah, I, I think the, the issue of eradication is a really, really interesting one because people have been talking about COVID-19 and the possibility of eradicating. It's actually going to be extraordinarily challenging to do that. And the reason for that is that there are other host species that this virus can replicate in. 
to be perfectly honest, from an evolutionary perspective, smallpox was pretty stupid. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it had one host, and, and that was humans. Do and better smallpox. Yeah. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't vary much, unlike, unlike the sort of virus that um, COVID is, <clears throat> which can mutate and uh, accumulate vari variation. Um, smallpox didn't do that. Um, there was even a case of taking... Ramesses V in ancient Egypt actually died of smallpox. We know this because we've got his mummy and his mummified remains, not his mummy. <laughs> uh, his mummified remains and, and on, on the cheek of that, um, of, of the face of the, the, the mummy are clear pustule marks, not, not um, scars, but the actual pustule. So we're pretty sure that he, he died of that. People have now been able to go in, take some material out of there and actually using PCR, technique in the laboratory to amplify DNA have actually shown that it was uh, smallpox DNA. So um, we know that these things have been around for a long time, but once we developed a vaccine that was effective at controlling it in the human population, and once we'd eradicated it from the human population, which was declared by WHO in 1977, then we knew that it wasn't coming back. Um, the only place smallpox is still, unfortunately, is in a couple of laboratories. We know that it's still in Russia, and we know that there's still laboratories in the US that uh, have the live virus as well. There's been a big debate in virology circles as whether it should be destroyed right across the planet. So we've been living with really uh, scary sounding germs for a really, really long time. Th those are in the distant past. We've got more recent examples of pandemics like swine flu and Ebola. Paul, can you talk us through those? Yeah, so I guess two of the most recent ones that have, have had impact um, globally have been um, uh, swine flu, which was in 2019. And that's, uh, that's the classic example of how... Sorry? 2000. 2009, sorry. Uh, that's the classic example of, um, of, of a virus that is able to mutate. And in this case, it actually recombines. And so uh, there are many influenza viruses in the bird population. And where we think new strains of influenza that um, hit the human population, the naive population, we've never seen them before, is when they spill out uh, from a bird population. Very rare that they actually spill directly. Um, they don't have the right sort of ways in which to infect um, uh, humans, so they have to go via another host, and it's usually, um, usually pigs. And so in 2009, there was a, um, a, a mingling of influenza viruses that reassorted or recombined into a new, ver a new influenza virus that was then able to replicate in humans, and that exploded out into the, into the global population. Um, influenza viruses are easily transmitted. They're respiratory pathogens. They, rap they rapidly infect and rapidly transmit, so they're the perfect, perfect viruses to spread uh, through a human population. That certainly happened uh, in 2009. With the Ebola outbreak, we've known about Ebola. It was first identified back in the 1970s, but, and, and sporadically there was these, been, been these little epidemics um, for the subsequent decades. Usually they were isolated little village environments and, um, where the virus would spill out and they would burn themselves out, as it were, um, in, in that local village environment. Because they so, couldn't transmit to other people. Exactly. I, again, a virus that's not adapted to its host. Um, what happened was that, unfortunately, it killed um, 70 to 80 percent of those people had infected and it did so rapidly and so those individuals weren't um, able to then transmit it on so there was a very limited transmission cycle uh, the problem in 2014 was that uh, one of these infected individuals did actually make it to the capital of uh, Guinea where this outbreak first occurred in March of 2014 and once it was in a populated area a densely populated area and unfortunately with poor health um, measures then uh, that was able to spread dramatically within Guinea and then out to Sierra Leone uh, and uh, Liberia as well. So that was the outbreak of uh, Ebola in 2014. So now that we've sufficiently terrorised our audience <laughs> with the idea of really scary viruses and bacteria that can infect us and kill us, let's talk about how we fight against them. So, Larissa, what's a vaccine and how does it work? Sure. So you've all got an immune system. Um, and what our immune system does is when we're infected with something like a virus or a bacteria, our immune system is what fights that off. So um, it, it arms itself, it, it develops these two ways to do it mainly. So it makes these antibodies, which I like to think of as little handcuffs that sort of stop the virus or bacteria from getting inside our cells, which is what they need to do in order to replicate. And that's what kind of causes disease. And the other thing that our immune system does is it makes these cells that go along and they'll kill any infected cells. 
So if you can imagine a virus has infected our cells, it turns our cell into a virus factory. And those T cells come along and they can eliminate that infected cell. And that's really important and usually pretty effective. And once we've cleared an infection, our immune system is smart and it doesn't sort of forget everything it learned about that particular virus or bacteria. It keeps some of that information on file so that if we get reinfected with the same thing, it knows how to fight it off really quickly. So this is called immune memory, and it's a really cool part of our immune system. And basically what vaccines do is they take advantage of that, and they trick our immune system into thinking that they've seen the virus or the bacteria before, so that our immune system has already made those antibodies and those T cells that can fight off the virus or the bacteria. So it just means that the virus or the bacteria doesn't have a chance to start um, infecting and replicating in us because our immune system is already ready to go. So, Paul, let's talk about some of the early vaccines. What was the first, well, what does history tell us was the first vaccine? History, history tells us that the first vaccine was uh, in the late 1700s by um, uh, Edward Jenner, who made this observation that um, uh, milkmaids actually had somewhat fair skin. In fact, there are nursery rhymes about the, f uh, the fair skin of milkmaids. Around that time, smallpox was ubiquitous in the population, so everybody who'd encountered the disease, usually early in life, had pock marks on their face, and for some reason, milkmaids were somewhat uh, uh, deficient in those, uh, in those uh, telltale signs of the infection. The observation he made was that instead, they had pock marks on their hands, and it was very similar to the pox in, that he saw in cattle. And so what he had observed, even though <clears throat> he really didn't know what a virus was, um, he'd observed that there was this disease in cattle that uh, milkmaids had been exposed to that seemed to be protecting them from this other human disease that looked somewhat similar. And he made the intuitive leap that what if I injected that, um, that pox virus from a cow into a human, would they then be protected like the milkmaids are? Uh, so he did the... Um, ethically appropriate study. I think he probably approached his ethic, local ethics committee uh, and he uh, enrolled the, the son of his gardener uh, to do a statistically valid study of one individual where he uh, uh, immunised or inoculated, again, the word immunised wasn't around, but he inoculated uh, some of that um, cowpox into um, uh, this boy, boy was Phipps, he, the gardener's name was Phipps, he was an eight-year-old. Uh, inoc uh, inoculated him and four weeks later uh, challenged him with uh, real smallpox, so then put smallpox in, and he didn't get the disease. He subsequently challenged that poor child 20 odd times, uh, and none of those times uh, did he uh, succumb to the disease. So he, ma he made the intuitive leap that what was happening here was that he was affording some sort of protection, basically the immune response that Larissa has just talked about, uh, that then meant that he was protected. Quite an uh, extraordinary intuitive leap, uh, uh, as I said before, because no one knew about infectious agents of, of virus or viruses. They knew that there was something that caused a disease, and they certainly didn't know about the immune response. Um, four weeks was arbitrarily chosen. Uh, it just so happens that four weeks is about the perfect time um, for, to allow an immune response to, to establish and protect. So that was that was what we attribute the first vaccine to, and that is a, uh, a closely related virus stimulating an immune response that protects against a, a human pathogen. The reality is people have been trial, trialling this for, for centuries, if not millennia. Uh, the ancient Chinese, more than 2,000 years ago, were doing a, a practice called variolation. Uh, what they would do is take the product of um, a smallpox um, vesicle uh, and turn it into a powder, dry it, turn it into a powder, and blow it up the nose of, uh, of individuals. That's like and a scab, right? They're putting a scab up someone's pretty nose. Pretty much. Awesome. Uh, and what they, what they had found was that that prior exposure um, led to protection. Again, it's, it's just one of those intuitive observations that people who survive smallpox tend not to get it again. So again, it's, it's a bit like a vaccine. You tend to be protected. There is this immune memory uh, that kicks into play when you're next exposed to it. So that... that understanding was actually floating around in China for quite some time. It travelled through to the Middle East, and in the Middle Ages, um, there was variolation in those, uh, in those populations as well. And it was really in that background that Jenner would have had some knowledge of how to take this forward. So that, but that was the first real um, modern um, vaccine, and it worked extremely well, as we subsequently showed. Is anyone here eight, or was recently eight? 
would you like to be injected with something that you know could kill a lot of people? <laughs> Because that's what Edward Jenner did to the boy. So what was the, what was the view of vaccination back in those days? And well, why is it called a vaccine? Because it comes from the word cow. Yeah, so um, it really comes because um, Edward Jenner took that, that cow virus um, and, and put that into, into children. When I think about those experiments, um, and speaking as someone who works in the lab a lot, the chances that an experiment is going to work that well <laughs> is just... Crazy, and actually, sometimes I wonder if there are kids we don't hear about, you know. <laughs> um, but so, because the the cow virus, um, cow in Latin is vaca, and so that's where the actual term vaccine comes from. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe the cow virus is slightly safer than giving someone a bit of smallpox scab up their nose because there was always a chance, right, that instead of triggering a protective immune response that you could actually have gotten sick from that bit of smallpox itself. So giving the bit of the cow virus was enough to trigger a protective response against smallpox without actually making you sick. So I, I think that's, that's, that's the key to this. It's about limited side effects from vaccination, which is what we expect of our vaccines uh, these days. You're absolutely right. Um, blowing a bit of smallpox up the nose did actually result in deaths as well. But if you, if you place your mind back in the context of populations 2,000 years ago where a disease could sweep through and, and decimate entire villages, and that's what they, they, they had, everyone in the village would, would die from, from these, um, these viruses. The alternative of maybe having a few die from this process, whereas m most, most people were protected, is, is, is a trade-off from a population perspective. The reality is, I think I mentioned before, that the, the idea of variolation came into the Middle East in the Middle, Middle Ages. So it had been around for hundreds of years, and people in Europe knew about it, but they weren't prepared to take that risk. That's the reason why it wasn't in Europe. I think we've got a picture to show of the way people thought about smallpox vaccines <laughs> at the time, wondering if they would have some strange side effects. Yes, I, I mean, um, the variolation or the way that the vaccine was, dis, uh, was um, uh, delivered was to, to take a small amount of the pox material and scarify it into the skin where the virus would grow and stimulate the immune response. And as you can see from the cartoon, the anti-vaxxers of their day um, were, were, were drawing cartoons with cows coming out of people's arms because they were putting in this foreign material. Which, of course, uh, didn't ha no one had a cow grow out of their arm. No. We know that for sure. <laughs> One, one of the early ways, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, the way this vaccine was actually delivered was literally taking a cow that was infected with um, cowpox, walking it around from village to village, and uh, they would, they would uh, arrive at a town hall and uh, the, set up a little shop outside the town hall with the villagers who would come along. You'd scrape off the cow and scrape it onto the individual. My how times have changed. <laughs> how times have changed. So that's a lot about smallpox. Let's talk about polio and some of the other vaccine preventable diseases we've seen. Um, Paul, what, what, what can you tell us about the polio vaccine? Yeah, so polio has been, also been with us for a long time. There are ancient uh, Egyptian um, um, reliefs that show uh, individuals with uh, paralyzed limbs, which are classic uh, flaccid uh, limb paralysis that uh, is associated with polio infection. So it's an infection that's been around for a long time. The late 1800s and early 1900s, um, it, it seemed to be on the rise as populations uh, came closer together and, and cities started to grow. Uh, and um, and we, we were seeing hundreds of thousands of deaths globally each year from, from polio. And so uh, in, a, in about 1930 or thereabouts, there was the development of uh, a range of vaccines, more modern vaccines. The idea behind a vaccine, as uh, Larissa has said, is you stimulate or tickle the immune response with what looks like a virus or a bacteria, but is actually either dead or, or just a component of the virus. So you get the immune response, you trick the, um, the host into thinking it's seeing the virus and it establishes an immune response. And so that's how the polio vaccine came about. Certainly in those you know, 1930s through to 1950s, the consequences were huge. I mean, right here in Brisbane, one whole uh, floor of the Royal Brisbane Hospital was devoted to iron lungs. I don't know if you've ever heard of what an iron lung is, but Polio is a gastrointestinal infection, occasionally goes across that layer uh, and uh, infects nerve tissue. And it goes into the central nervous system and can cause paralysis in a small number of cases. And that paralysis, um, one, one of the symptoms can be that you lose uh, 
uh, the capacity uh, to, um, um, to breathe. And so you ha actually have to spend your entire life in an iron lung that provides that, uh, that uh, exchange, that air exchange for you, literally, mechanically um, assisting in, 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 uh, in breathing. And you know, we had whole wings, as I said, of these iron lungs with children and then adults who lived probably through to middle age uh, with, these, uh, with these diseases. And in the 1950s, uh, vaccines were established, two sorts. One was a killed vaccine, one was a live vaccine. And so the killed vaccine, you just take the virus and you inactivate it in various ways, chemically or UV light. Uh, and another way is to just weaken the virus. So it's still live, but it no longer causes disease, but it still stimulates an immune response. And that oral polio vaccine, we call it, was what was used um, for decades to almost eradicate polio. Uh, the World Health Organization had polio next on its list after it eradicated smallpox, and the target date was the year 2000, and we were heading really close to that. Um, Australia had been free of polio for a decade or more. We don't vaccinate here anymore because we don't have polio in this, uh, in, in this country. But unfortunately, vaccine hesitancy and the challenges of delivering vaccine has meant that it's just trickled along. And we're seeing now, say, hundreds of cases globally in, in countries like Afghanistan and, and some, some of the African countries. We haven't quite been able to nip that one. But polio is another one that we can eradicate because it really only grows uh, in, in humans. So these guys won't have had a smallpox vaccine and they won't have had a polio Correct. vaccine, but you've obviously had vaccines before. You get jabbed like a pincushion when you're a baby and then you get a couple more as you get older. Larissa, what are some of the vaccines that these kids would have gotten? So you would have had a measles vaccine. That one's pretty important. Um, HPV. Mumps, rubella. Yeah, Hepatitis. What else? There's about, Hepatitis, there's about 30 yeah. different um, vaccine um, pathogens for which we've got multiple vaccines. Yeah. Uh, now, so a, a whole array based on either this idea of, um, of killing the virus and using that, or in the case of measles, it's actually a live virus, but it's been what we call attenuated or weakened so that it doesn't cause disease, but stimulates an immune response. And more recently, we've been using a recombinant technologies that, where we can generate with the genetic sequence of the uh, target uh, parts of the virus that stimulate the immune response, we can actually make them now um, firstly in the laboratory, but, but then for a commercial vaccine in large, huge vats, a bit like ma making beer. It's essentially <laughs> the same process. It's a fermentation process, and you actually just make a lot of this protein as a vaccine. Well, I think what's um, really important is because you all have been vaccinated, that's why we, you know, we don't really see how devastating some of these diseases can be, right? We don't have to live with smallpox. We don't have to live with polio. Most of us don't get measles because we've all been vaccinated. So it's kind of easy to forget just how good vaccines are and how important they are. But without vaccines, we'd have no protection against a lot of these viral diseases. Because of antibiotics, we have a lot more protection against some bacterial diseases. But even there, um, that's starting to be a problem because some of those bacteria are becoming resistant. So vaccines have been and will continue to be really important in keeping us all alive and saving us from these devastating diseases, which we definitely don't want to get. So no one likes getting needles, but one vaccine that we're hoping to get soon is for COVID-19. So let's talk about this pandemic that we're living in and where it came from and why. Larissa, what is COVID and where did it come from? So COVID um, is... It stands for coronavirus-induced disease, uh, 2019. And um, it's caused by a tiny little virus called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, <laughs> which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so let's shorten that to SARS-2. Um, and what we know about this virus is we think that it came from bats, probably. And why do we think it came from bats? Well, that's because uh, SARS-1, which ravaged Southeast Asia in about 2003, it's very similar in terms of its genetic, its genetic sequence, so it's kind of like a, a brother or sister of SARS-2. Um, it came from a bat originally, and uh, people have looked at bats, and they've, they've looked at all the viruses that bats have, and there are a lot of other sort of very closely related SARS viruses in there. So we think that this virus was in a bat, and at some point, either through an intermediate animal, so this could have been, you know, Paul talked about flu coming through pigs. Well, for, for the bats, it could have 
been some other animal that's around there, and then somehow it's, it's gone into humans. Um, so we don't know exactly when this happened, and what's had to have happened is that the virus has, has gotten into a human and it's kind of gone, oh, this is nice in here. I think I might, you know, try and, and replicate and infect that human. Um, this has become a really nice host. And all of a sudden, it's spread. And obviously, we knew that the first outbreak was in China. And because this virus spreads through um, the respiratory tract, so we know that it, by talking or singing or even breathing, it can spread into the air and it's quite contagious, so people can easily get it through, the, through breathing it in. Um, it was able to spread really quickly. And then, of course, with planes, all of a sudden, it's not just in China, but it's everywhere. And now you've seen what's happened. It's a, a global pandemic. It's funny, isn't it? Because we were talking about those old diseases. We didn't understand what a bacteria was or what viruses were, and we didn't have medicine for it. These days, we have so much knowledge, so many smart scientists like you guys, and so much good medicine, but we also are really interconnected as a globe in a way that we weren't in the olden days, and so that's actually made it even yeah. harder. Yeah. So, Paul, we talked before about Ebola and how Ebola can kill a really big proportion of the people that it infects, and COVID doesn't infect, doesn't kill as quickly as that, which is part of the reason why it's so dangerous. Yeah, exactly. The, if you think about it, we don't want to anthropomorphize viruses <laughs> that they, they, they're thinking and, and wanting to do things. The reality is what a virus is, is a population of, gene of, of independent genetic material. What happens is there's mutations happening all the time, just randomly. So that population of viruses just grows and replicates most efficiently when it's selected in a particular environment. Right? So um, what, what has happened, for example, you, you might have heard that there are some changes happening in SARS-CoV-2 as it's moved through the human population. Well, what that is is just um, individual mutations being selected that are growing more efficiently or escaping you know, the um, immune pressure of the immune system. So this is a virus that has the ability to mutate and, uh, and replicate, but it doesn't kill like Ebola does. It doesn't have a fatality rate of 80%. Um, it has a much lower fatality rate, higher than influenza, and it's why it's caused a huge problem around the world. But in many individuals, uh, you, it can even lead to no disease at all, but still replication of the virus in the respiratory tract. So they, these individuals can be moving around and actually efficiently transmitting. So this is a virus that sort of hit, as I said a little bit earlier, hit that sweet spot of having just the right amount of uh, infectivity in terms of causing disease, but the right amount of transmission capacity to be able to spread very rapidly as well. And just getting back to the um, respiratory pathogens and plane transport and our ability to move around the world. If you actually look, you can just Google it, look for plane traffic over a 48 hour period. And basically you can get from one place in the world to any other part of the world in 48 hours. Perfect incubation period for a, uh, for a respiratory virus. So it's possibly one of the main reasons why this virus was able to spread so rapidly around the world. Now, of course, the name of this session is Race for, for a Cure, so let's talk about the race. Larissa, what do we know so far about the way we can treat someone who's already got COVID-19? Yeah, well, it's tough. <laughs> um, so uh, this has been a big question for a lot of doctors, of course. Um, so there are, there are three kind of things we can do. Uh, we can try and give them recombinant antibodies. So uh, I talked before about how our immune system makes antibodies to fight off the virus, and they're really good at stopping the virus from getting into cells. So what scientists are able to do is make those antibodies in a lab, and we know that they're really good at stopping the virus from getting in, and then they can inject them into people. So actually, this technology is what um, the former US President Trump got when he was sick with COVID, um, this antibody cocktail. And they work in other diseases too. Um, so another thing that people want to use are antivirals. So it, it's not quite the same, but it's kind of like an antibiotic. So these stop the viruses from replicating. You might have heard of remdesivir. This is one that was tested a lot. Um, it's a way to stop the virus in its tracks. Um, but the trouble with those is, is when to give them to patients. So they work best early on in disease, so quite often before people are showing symptoms. And then it's really hard to diagnose. If you don't feel sick um, and you don't know that you've got COVID, how are you meant to treat it, right? And often by the time people were going to hospital, it was too late. 
So we know that kind of one of the next phases of COVID is this really um, extreme immune response. So if you can imagine um, if, if you're infected and your immune system is a bit slow on the uptake and it's just chilling and it's not really noticed anything and all of a sudden this virus is out of control and so all of a sudden your immune system panics and it tries to throw everything it's got at the virus. And unfortunately, instead of just taking out the virus, it starts causing all this collateral damage and starts, it starts hurting your body itself. And that's where we start getting a lot of breathing problems. Um, we get this thing called cytokine storm, which is basically just the immune system going crazy. And what they found was that if you give some immunosuppressants to actually calm down the immune system, that helps in some of the severely hospitalized patients. But we still don't really know why some people have like you know, that kind of Goldilocks scenario of the just right immune response, whereas some people have too little or too much. And that's the kind of research that I do, is trying to work that out. Um, but probably the best thing we want to have is, is prevention, right, and to have a vaccine. So that's something that Paul can definitely talk a lot about. <laughs> yeah, I, but also fill in that other part of the gap. And, and, and certainly when um, SARS-CoV-2 first appeared, it was a new, new virus. We didn't have these antivirals. We didn't have the antibodies. We didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't have vaccines. So what do you do? I mean, the, the best strategy is public health measures. And, and that's where the social distancing came into play. Um, our government, as opposed to many others, shut down our international borders very quickly. And that, that um, really did effectively allow us to deal with the small amount of COVID spread we had in the early days and, and get on top of that whilst not allowing any further in. And in other countries, they just kept getting reintroductions of uh, the virus into their communities. And, and um, being in a country where you had those international border blocks allowed us to deal state by state with, with the outbreaks that occurred, like for example in Melbourne, which was you know, uh, extra extraordinarily unfortunate, but they were able to dampen that curve very, very quickly. So all of those measures of social distancing and contact tracing, so just knowing you know, being able to find an individual, identify an individual who was infected, who they had actually contacted, so you could go and test those individuals. So ramping up our ability to diagnose. That was one of the first things that happened uh, very effectively here in Australia. We developed our own diagnostics extraordinarily quickly. Um, one of the things that's happened over this last year has been the incredible sharing of information right across the globe. And you know, the reason why we were able to establish a diagnostic so quickly is that the Chinese shared um, information on the sequence of the virus way back in January, so very, very early on. And with that information, we were able to develop quick, rapid diagnostics mm. that we could apply, but also that was the kick off for our vaccines as well. And so that's all buying us time to develop the vaccine quickly. What goes into making a vaccine? Yeah, I sort of started the explanation of that before, and, and that is what we're trying to do. Larissa, Larissa mentioned that we're just trying to trick uh, our immune system into thinking that it's seeing the real virus. So it's just how we do that, and there are multiple ways of doing that. I mean, I, I've mentioned a couple of traditional approaches, and they're killing the, the pathogen and using that, and there is a vaccine um, that was developed in China uh, that is currently on, uh, being used in, I think, South America predominantly and in China as well. So you just kill it so that it still looks like a virus, so it stimulates the immune system, but it doesn't replicate, doesn't grow. Uh, another is to make an attenuated virus, so a weakened virus. I mean, cowpox was naturally attenuated because it was the wrong host, but what we do is we can make a weakened virus in the lab. That actually takes a long period of time, so while there is one of those being developed, it's, it's not being very effective. The other way is to just take bits of the virus. Um, the, our vaccine that we, uh, we developed was to focus on just one protein on the surface of the virus, so what the virus shows to the immune system. Um, take the gene that encodes that, the genetic information that encodes that, and make the protein in one of those big fermenters. And we'd actually got to the point of making millions of doses of that particular vac uh, vaccine and shown that it worked very effectively uh, in um, what we call a phase one clinical study. So we actually went into humans and showed they mounted a really good immune response. You didn't just inject it into one eight-year-old? We did not. <laughs> uh, uh, we also went through the very detailed process of doing uh, preclinical work, so before you go into the clinic, to show that it induces a good immune response and it was safe before you actually go into uh, a, a human clinical trial. We didn't progress that vaccine, but we're now developing uh, uh, a, a new version of that vaccine. I think out of this year, the thing that's been most exciting is this technology that's been around for about 20 years, 
but have never had the opportunity to really be tested at scale before, and that's to take the genetic information itself and inject that. And that's what the messenger RNA vaccines are, if you've heard about those. Um, so it's literally just the genetic information which is injected, it gets inside cells, and the cells, our cells, make the protein, and that protein then gets um, exposed to our immune system, so we generate a response. And that's turned out to be extremely effective. I suspect that the work that's gone into that over the last year will mean that vaccines of the future, many of the vaccines of the future, will probably have that as a platform uh, going forward. So uh, this year, I mean, we <coughs> moved at breakneck speed. The first vaccine to be delivered into humans as an emergency treatment was 11 months after the first sequence was known of this virus. That, that sort of timescale has never happened before. So no one, took, no one took any shortcuts, but what we were able to do is concertina and, and run in parallel a lot of the activities we normally um, uh, progress down to develop a vaccine. Can normally sometimes take 15 or 20 years. Here we're, here we're developing a vaccine in, in, in 12 months. And those vaccines are very effective. We've now put them out into a large population um, um, group and we, we're getting the data back that there's very little in the way of side effects, but strong stimulation of protective immunity. So a process that usually takes years has taken just uh, uh, one year and we'll probably be all getting vaccines in Australia soon. Talk about a race for a cure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to Larissa and Paul for sharing your knowledge with us. Well done and see you next time. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>